giving and obedience, and we can't outgive him. Amen. You just can't. You just can't outgive the Lord because he's so faithful and he's so good. Amen. Hallelujah. Also, you many of you have seen this. I've announced it, but our, our one of our guest instructors on September 23rd at Supernatural School, and it's not just Steve, but Steve and Marcy Fish will be with us as guest instructors. They're just amazing people. They, they're the lead senior leaders at um, Convergence Church in Fort Worth. They do a lot with Heidi Baker and uh, with Iris, and I know on a regular basis they're flying to Mozambique or other places to help with uh, relief and some of those things, and um, they're just real mothers and father, a real mother and father in the faith, and if you've ever met them, you're very aware of the grace that's on their life, so it's really exciting that we get to have Steve and Marcy with us on that Monday night. I am so thrilled, and I just really appreciate them, so amen. At this time, let's dismiss the kids to go to Children's Church, and uh, we're thankful for our Children's Church workers and everything that God is doing in the, in the, in the, in children's church. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Praise God. Well, it's good to see you guys today and, um, God's faithful. He's good. Thank you for all your prayers. I'll get situated here in a minute and, uh, hallelujah. Not used to working with a mic, but Hallelujah. It's nobody's fault, Jamie's. No, <laughs> just messing with her. <laughs> so praise God, we're we're in week two of our series on discipleship. Amen. And uh, and we're talking about what does discipleship, what does spiritual formation look like? Amen. How many of you guys know we're always in process? You know, no matter where you are in your life as a child of God, as a follower of Jesus, he is always working and always conforming us to his image. That's part of your journey, right? And the thing is, God really, really loves the process. Amen. A lot more than we do. Sometimes we don't like the process, right? We get, we joke about this. We get, we get mad when, you know, Popeye's runs out of their new chicken sandwich, right? Because we want it now. Heaven forbid that you're going to Popeye's instead of Chick-fil-A, you guys. Right? Just need to repent and come back to the Lord. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, <laughs> hallelujah. But there's a process that we're in. God's conforming us, amen. And, and let's talk about, just for a minute, and I, I touched on this last night before we get into what the message is really about, but formation looks like growing in our relationship with God, right? We're always growing in that. We're always learning to hear his voice more clearly, right? Because he's always speaking. He's continually renewing our mind to his, amen? God wants us to think like he does, right? He says we have the mind of Christ, but there's a, po there's a part of that where we're being conformed, we're being conformed to how he thinks, how, wh li loving what he lo loves, disliking what he likes, what he what he doesn't like. When I'll get that right, right. Um, then there's that element of discipleship. Discipleship is really about following Jesus. Did you know that Jesus said more than just say a prayer and you're good? He said, "No, follow me." Right. Do what I'm saying. Live like I lived, right? And he modeled certain things. We're to follow what he taught, but we're also to do what he did, okay? And what would Jesus do is more than being polite, right? Sometimes don't you think that that was the whole, that whole movement was about just being polite, right? And those things are good. It's so important to have the character and the nature of Christ, but it's also to do the things that he did. And it's and part of that is spreading the gospel that he preached accompanied by power. Amen. And so all those things. So today, um, one of the things that I, that I really want to talk about, and this is such a fun topic, it's such a big topic, and I'm barely going to scratch the surface when we talk about it, but I want to talk about humility. Uh, everybody just is like, oh, man, I should have gone away for the weekend. I knew it. 
I should have gone. But, you know, man, humility was essential to Jesus' life and ministry. And yet, it seems to be a great struggle for us, right? And it's not, when I, you know, when I say the word humility, there's so many different things that come to our mind, you know, and we, a lot of times it's often false humility that comes to our mind. So we're going to talk about what humility is and how Jesus demonstrated it, okay? So I want us to turn, first of all, to Philippians chapter 2. All right, let's turn to Philippians chapter 2. Um, and let's read. I wanted to really zero in, hone in on verses 8 and 9. But let's go back and start reading in verse 5. Philippians 2, verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Amen. Now, I don't think any of us have yet humbled ourselves to the point of death on a cross, right? And the reality is Jesus lived his life in humility. And humility really in its, in its rawest form means that we are totally dependent upon the Father. Right? What's the very nature of sin? Right? What happened in the garden that caused mankind to fall? It was the reality that there were two trees. And there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There was more than two trees, but, you know, those are what we focus on, right? And that would be like Kansas, two trees in the whole state, right? But <laughs> it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And God was like, man, he, he said, eat, eat of all these trees, especially the tree of life. But what do we do? What did man do? Right? We, we ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because we want to live in dependence on who we are, our strength, our ability, our own wisdom, our own understanding. We want to be like God without being conformed to his image, right? Without embracing every part of his life and saying, God, I'm living my life according to what you say. Like Jesus said, man, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by everything, every word, everything that comes out of the mouth of God. Dependence on Him, trust in Him. That is humility. And that's how Jesus lived His life. Amen. He lived in that, that state of, of, you know, I'm going to rely on the Father. That's why when Jesus would spend, you know, hours during the day teaching, ministering, multiplying bread, uh, multiplying loaves and fishes, doing the miraculous, ca casting out demons. And then he would go and he would spend hours with the Father because he understood that authority came out of the secret place. He understood that authority came out of being intimate with the Father. And we've got a generation right now, right? And I'm, I'm including myself in that and want to be conformed where we want the authority without the intimacy. We want the authority and we want to do the stuff without the intimate place of being with the Father, right? We want, we have to start with humility. We have to start in that place of dependence on Him. And uh, the good news is, you know, He's made it available to us. Right? Pride came from Adam, and what's the opposite of humility? It's pride. Whereas humility is offered to us by the second Adam, by Jesus, by the Son of God. And he wants to meet us 
in that place. Now, let's give a little bit of further definition to humility. It is uh, the place of entire dependence upon God. Amen. I want. I've got a great quote here from Andrew Murray, and Andrew Murray was a a well-known Christian writer. I believe he was Dutch. He he spent much much of his life in ministry in South Africa. They say if you even go into South Africa and some of the places where he lived and ministered, there is a different presence because of what he lived and what he imparted. I mean, I mean it, would that be a great testimony? That someday after you're gone, people go into your place of assignment and they're like, good grief, there's, there's a different presence of God here because Dusty Hucks lived here. Would that be a great testimony? Or there's a, there's a different atmosphere in this city because Jim and Martha Summers were here and because of how they lived. Man, man I, I want that to be my testimony, that there's a residue of the glory and the presence of the anointing because of how I live my life, right? You know, a lot of people, and I I hope to go there someday, Moravian Falls in North Carolina, and Charlie and Bryn Champ are getting ready to move there and base their ministry there, and Susan Starr, many of you know Susan lives there. You know, that, that place, many people say, is an open heaven because there was a group of Moravians that lived there. And if you don't know who the Moravians are, stick around a little bit longer, and I promise you I'll preach about them someday. But there, there's something of our lives that can be imparted and still remain. And I totally got off on this, but, you know, man, Andrew Murray, he, he changed a nation. Andrew Murray said, The life God bestows is not imparted once for all, but each moment for the unceasing operation of his mighty power. Now, wouldn't it be easy if we could cast pride out? Man, we'd be lined up for deliverance right now, right? Because it would be great if you could just cast that spirit of pride out, but, you know, or we can get an impartation, wouldn't it be great and somebody could just lay hands on you and you would have immediate humility? If you didn't sign up, I'd sign you up for it. <laughs> right? <laughs> or you could, <laughs> she's already got me signed up, right? <laughs> or, you know, a baptism service or once you get saved and you're forever humble, right? You get that once, because we like that, you know. Impartation times, man, we'll run to the front, But not always will we sign up for supernatural school or prayer time or to clean the church, right? Because there are moments of just that daily, daily saying, God, touch me. Because God's, God, lo- I said this earlier, God loves the process. God loves to meet us actually in the mundane places. Right, in in our job. Right, in our marriages, and how we're raising our kids, you know, all those things. And He's working humility out in us when we just say, "God, well, I need you today. I, I need you to meet me in the everyday moments." And God so wants to do that, Amen, because He wants us in this constant state of walking with and depending on God. Just like the children of Israel, you know. Uh, God, every day, he put the manna out. And sometimes we want to live on yesterday's manna. Well, God, I collected a whole bunch of manna yesterday, and I would really wanted to sleep in today. Well, you missed it today. He wants to meet you every day. Amen. So let's talk about... Two key principles in humility, okay? So we know it's dependence on God. First of all, in humility, there's this element that we present ourselves as an empty vessel to be filled by God. Man, that's so important, you know? How many of you know we need to be filled up a lot? Because we leak, right? God, 
you know, Jesus even, I made mention of it earlier, he kept going back to the Father because he poured out everything that he had. And because he poured out everything that he had, and even though he was God, he lived as a man dependent upon the Holy Spirit. He understood, I've got to go back to the Father. I've got to go back to the well. I've got to go back to the Lord's table every day and refill myself so that I can give out, so that I can give out what he's given me. So we have to present ourselves in dependence on the Lord as an empty vessel. And when we do this, he manifests his power and his goodness to us. Aren't you glad when, when you're like, God, I've just poured out and I could keep going in the power of my own strength and the power of what I've experienced and what I've known. But, Lord, I just have to come back to you again because I need you. I'm dependent upon you. I'm not just dependent upon that great prophetic word I got 10 years ago. Right now, do we still war and still believe for those things, sometimes decades later? Absolutely. And we understand those principles, but there's this constant, Lord, I'm dependent on you. I need you to fill me. No matter how much I've experienced you, no matter how much you've poured into me, I've poured back out. And I need you to fill me. So we present ourselves to the Lord so that he can fill us back up. Now, Another thing is, and so we, we just have to, we have to present ourselves in utter dependence. Now, also, there's this, there's this understanding that um, he's dealing with our old nature in the middle of all this. All right. Anybody ever have trouble with their old nature? Don't raise your hand. Yeah, it's too late. We saw, I saw that hand. I, I would venture to say that we all do. Right? We all we all struggle with that. And the thing is, as we present ourselves to God in utter dependence upon him, he's meeting us. Now, I want us to turn. Let's turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. And I want to especially look at verses 4 and 5. But let's just go ahead and I, I know I, let's go ahead and look at start reading in verse 1 as well though. Ever try to overcome the old nature and your own strength? How that work out for you? Not good. It wasn't good, right? So let's look, beginning reading in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it that it may bear more fruit. Hallelujah. Don't you love being pruned? You understand when you're experiencing pruning, it's because God really loves you. And you're being fruitful, and he wants you to bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me. And I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Let's say that together. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Hallelujah. We as Americans don't like that very much, do we? Bless God, we're independent. Right? We're going to see it done. We're going to stand on our own strength. But Jesus said, Man, apart from me, you can't do it. You're not capable. So in verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, um, ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done for you. By this is my Father glorified 
that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. How do you prove that you're a disciple? You bear much fruit. Do you know, God really is a fruit inspector. He really is. But you know why? Because he loves you. He loves you. And he's like, you know, man, I, I love that Emily. Right? But I'm going to examine her fruit. Oh, look, she's walking in love and she's walking in forgiveness. Now I want a little bit more. So I'm going to cut a little bit away right here and trim up because I love her so much. She's my disciple, and I want to show her off. I want to see more glory actually come out of her life. Because she's a city set on a hill, and I want her to shine. So I'm going to deal a little bit right here with her because I love her, and I want her to shine and demonstrate even greater glory. Isn't that encouraging? I think that's God's perspective more than, well, she's messed up, and I'm just going to, I'm going to cut this away. <laughs> no, it's because, man, God really does want you to shine, and it's because he's a co-laborer with us, and he gets the glory, but at the same time, he wants to demonstrate who he is through you, and I would even dare say it brings a little bit of glory. Because he chooses to work through people and through humanity. And so, you know, but it, in the middle of that, there's that dependence upon him. Hallelujah. Now, sometimes we have to allow the old life to be cut off. There are all things that we struggle with. Sin. Sometimes we struggle with sin. And sometimes it is bad, yucky sin. Right? And then sometimes it's the secret attitudes of the heart. Right? Sometimes they're secret and sometimes they're not so secret. <laughs> right? But the thing is, God is working. And one of the things that he often wants to really touch when he starts dealing with the old life is he really wants to touch self and self-centeredness. Right? You know, for years, Jamie and I were... Uh, part of Family of Faith in Shawnee, Oklahoma. Jamie's a graduate of that college. I'm in their master's program right now combined with Global Awakening. And, you know, if you've ever, many of you have been a part or of that place and some of their services, you know, if you're going to be a part of Family of Faith, you, it's a requirement that you read a book called Reese Howe's Intercessor. It just is cause, because of Dr. Matthews and his connection to that ministry and the mantle that he has for intercession and and if you've read that book, you understand that it is a difficult book. If you've tried to read that book and not completed it, then you understand it's a difficult book, right? Because Reese Howes lived this life of intercession. He's the guy who established the Bible College of Wales. Um, you know, long story. I don't want to get into that. If you haven't read it, read it. But that book has spoken to us a lot of the, over the years because of Reese Howes and how he encountered the Holy Spirit. And as a young man, and he was alive during the Welsh revival of the early 1900s, he was greatly touched by the presence of God, revival, all those things. But there came a moment where the Holy Spirit came to him and showed him, he said, you know, I'm not just an influence that comes on meetings, but I'm God, and I want to fill you. I, I'm looking for a temple. Does the Bible not say that we're temples of the Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit basically came, and, and when you read this account, it really upsets a lot of our charismatic and Pentecostal revival, renewal traditions. Because, and part of the reason the Holy Spirit does come and fill us is because he wants to give us power. But the Holy Spirit came to Reese, and he said, basically, I want to come in and fill you, but if I come in, you must go out. And he said, I, I, 
I want to do all these things in your life, but two wills can't live in the same body. And so over the course of several days and like about a week or so, the Holy Spirit dealt with him and he said, and I can't remember what day it was, but he says, you have until this day at like six o'clock to decide if you want me to fill you. That's a crazy thought, isn't it? Right? And the Holy Spirit began to deal with Reese in that period because he said, you know, if I'm going to come in, you have to put your self-will down. Now, this goes beyond just sin. Because sometimes we live in this place of, well, if I don't just sleep around or do drugs or or steal or all that, I'm good, or spread gossip or beat my wife, you know, those are all good things that we don't do, right? Don't do those things. But the Holy Spirit began to deal and put his finger on things like his reputation. He said, you know, I want to live through you in such a way that even if I call you to live like John the Baptist, and out in the country, out in the wilderness, dressing crazy, doing crazy things, if that's what I call you to do, I'm going to do that. And you, you can't worry about your reputation. Anybody ever been there? When God wants to do something through you, you're like, well, what if people think I'm crazy? I mean, we, we struggle with that as a church. I'm just being honest. Because sometimes God does crazy things, and people don't like you when he does it because it offends them. But he began to deal with his reputation. He began to deal with that, that self thing and even competition. And the Lord even said something like, showed him like, what if you start a mission? And a lot of times they would call like missions. It was like a ministry or a church in that village. And the Lord said, what if, what if you start a, a mission and somebody else comes along and they also start a mission and there's jealousy? The Lord said, I'll, I'll require you to shut yours down. Is that so against American culture? Well, we're going to start a church, and it's going to be better. Our worship is going to be better, and we're going to have more miracles, and we're going to have more presence, and we're going to have more decisions because it's going to bring greater, greater to glory to God, and we'll show them. That's really at the heart of some people. We all deal with it in ministry sometimes. I'm just telling you guys. But God showed him, he said, you know, you're not, you're, you're not going to have a right to do what you think is best. You're going to follow me. I'm going to deal, he said, I'm going to deal with the love of money in your life. Ouch. We, do y'all love money? I do. I'm just saying, don't sit in pious like, yeah, I do not, I'm not hindered by that one bit. No, we all are. It's it, money's necessary. It is a tool, but we all love it. And, and God wants to break the love of money in our lives. And the Lord even, Holy Spirit said, you know, there'll even be times when I'm not going to, unless I tell you to give in this area, you can't give or buy. Now, again, these are all really radical things. And Reese Howe's life really offends a lot of people because it's so radical. But, if you read his life, how he lived produced such lasting fruit that we're living, if not for his intercessions and the intercessions of those at the Bible College of Wales during World War II, England would have lost the war. England would have totally lost, which who knows how that would have affected the rest of the world. It's the intercessor that changes the course of history. And God even lived through Reese Howes in such a way that he would give him strategy on how to pray in specific battles. And they would start praying specific strategies and, and stuff would happen and it would cause the Nazis to lose. And it didn't make any sense. 
when the Holy Spirit would come and say, I want you to begin to pray a certain way. Is it important as intercessors that we pray the prayers that God gives us and not just often what we think is best? So the Holy Spirit, he began to put his finger on all these things because it was dealing with self-nature. Our opinion. Or our rights. Well, I have a right to this. And one of the things that God even dealt with him, and this is radical, this upsets some people and scares some people. But the Lord said, I'm even going to, I'm dealing with you about your right to even make a home. Because I'm going to send you to nations. And the Lord did that. And the Lord sent Reese Howells to the nation of Africa. And when he went, everybody was like, this guy's coming from the, the land where the revival is which is obviously Wales. Even in Africa, they'd heard of what God was doing in Wales in that time. And they went, and for about six weeks, there was intercession and prayer given, and then the revival began to break out. Right? And it was powerful what God began to do. But before he ever went, the Lord began to deal with him and said, you don't have the right to make a home. Well, bless God, I have the Constitution gives me rights. No, if, we're, if we have the nature of the Lamb, the only right we have is what the Father says. Wow. Isn't that a good word and a good thought? That's hard. And there were times when, you know, God was preparing to take us to the nation of Japan, and the Lord would say, you don't have any rights. That'll mess with your, I'm going to name it and claim it and confess it till it happens when the Lord says, you don't have any rights. Because the Holy Spirit began to put his finger on certain things and said, I want to live through you in such a manner. It means that you put your will down. You know what Reese Howe's response was? No. Lord, this is impossible, and I cannot do it in my own strength. I can't do this. I'm not able. And he said, but Lord, if you're willing to make me willing, Lord, I'll do it. And he had moments left on the clock. And some of us are like, well, God would never put a deadline on somebody. Well, he does it every day. There are people that die and go into eternity every day. We don't like to think about that. And they've missed it. Not because of God. Not because God isn't just and not because God doesn't love incredibly. He does. He's given every opportunity. And, And the Lord said, you have until this time. And at the last moment, he said, God, I'm willing. I'm dependent on you. Make me willing. And God so met him. There was so much glory that came, and there was so much glory on him in those days, and even throughout his life. And and the and, and again, I'm not here to lift up Reese House. There are things I don't like about Reese House. There are things that I'm like, I'm not sure this is right theology. But the fruit of his life produced something remarkable and it was just this thing of you know god i'm i'm dependent upon you and god what you say i'm going to do and how i'm going to live my life abiding in the vine and god let that i, I want to live in such a way attached and part of this life of the vine that you're going to flow through me And you know what the fruit of that was? That everybody else gets to partake of the fruit. If you really live your life, and if we really live our lives 
abiding in the vine and attached to the life of the vine. Not only does it bless us, but everybody around us gets to partake of the fruit. Right? They get to feast on what the Holy Spirit is producing in your life. And it produces great breakthrough. I want to read, this is one of the things that Reese Howell said. He said, one thing the husband man cannot do is graft the old life into the vine. Self can never abide in the Savior, not one atom of it. Before you can be grafted into the vine, you must be cut off from the old life. The vine can't do anything without the branch. Right. So if we want the power of the life of God, and we all want that. Man, I, I want the life of the vine. I want the glory. I want the presence. I want all those things. But there are those moments when Jesus says, man, I want to meet you. And I want to give you my life, but I'm going to cut off some of those old things so that you'll be dependent upon me. Man, isn't this a good word? Some of y'all are like deer in the headlights this morning. Because, you know, sometimes that even puts away stuff on like our, our right to be offended. Our right to gossip. Well, I'm just letting you know so you can pray. I'm just a concerned citizen and churchgoer. And so Reese had this encounter with the Lord. Now, if you look at church history, what was really happening at that moment in history as well, and I think this did influence him, was the holiness movement. And the holiness movement was that movement where people were believing that they could encounter the Lord and they would have an experience where they were forever sanctified and set apart and they wouldn't struggle with sin anymore. Right? And there are, there are denominations and movements that teach that. I believe God can touch us and break the power of things in our life, but I believe that sanctification is a lifelong process of pursuit. Doesn't mean there's not a moment where we are not encounter the Lord and completely changed. I think it's kind of both. And that may sound like I'm sidestepping a theological issue. I'm really not. I'm saying that God, I believe in experiences, encounters where God so touches us. And if you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you get that. You get so supercharged that you're like, man, I, I'm, I'm not even on the ground. Right? But there's that daily, God touched me. Lord, I know you zapped me with your power, but now you're wanting to meet me in these moments of humility and walking with you in the encounter. Right? Another part of humility that's a big part, and, uh, Man, these aren't sermons that we really love in the church right now. They're not very seeker-friendly. No one really wants to... I'm just working on my humility. Right? Ugh. <laughs> well, the Holy Spirit is. And isn't it just like God to, to work on our humility whether we want it or not? He does that. Because why? He's... Oh, you're doing really good. This branch is beautiful, but, man, I want a lot. I want it to be a lot more beautiful next spring. So if I could just correct this one attitude, I'm going to trim this part here. So in the spring, it's going to be beautiful. Sometimes, sometimes trimming season's rough. Not because God wants to humiliate us. But he wants to produce greater glory and greater fruit. Hallelujah. Now, servanthood. Servanthood is a big demonstration of humility. Right? And, and I, who, who, who lived the greatest example of humility and servanthood than Jesus did? 
man, it's it's remarkable how he lived and how he served. And let's let's read out of Mark ten, Mark ten verses forty three and forty through forty five. Mark chapter ten, verses forty three through forty five. Whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Man, that was Jesus' whole purpose in coming. We read it at the beginning of the service. He, he poured out everything that was within his life. Right? He poured everything out in dependence and humility on the Lord. And he, it's because he knew what the Lord was going to do. But you know what? When, when we keep our eyes on the face of Jesus, the purposes of God, it's not hard to pour your life out. It's not hard. To pour your worship out when you see him. Man, I love that from Upper Room. And it's we've listened to it, and sometimes Olivia sang it. That man, when I don't don't let me have that moment when I see your face. Don't let me miss an opportunity where I could have poured out more and I missed it because I didn't know what you look like. When I missed giving. When I missed pouring out my life and pouring out my heart because I really didn't know you. And I really didn't see your face. Because I think if, because we worship by faith, you guys, don't we? I mean, we can feel the presence of God and we can encounter him and worship and all those things. But there's an element of faith. Man, when we see him face to face, and this, this isn't a guilt trip or anything like that, so... But when we see him face to face, I don't ever want to say, man, God, I missed it. And now I see you in all your glory. And I could have given more. Could have given more away. You know, who's, who's seen that movie Schindler's List? I've watched it once. I've never been able to watch it again. Do you remember the end? When Schindler had rescued all these Jews and kept them from the, going to the concentration camp, and he was like, I could have done more. I could have sold this pen and saved another life. And he was broken because even though he gave so much, he was like, I didn't do enough. And I'm not, again, this is not... A guilty thing, but in the light of eternity. You know, it says he'll wipe away every tear from our eyes because I think sometimes we're going to be filled with regret in heaven. Not because of what we did, but sometimes because of what we didn't do. And the opportunities we missed and the things we missed... Because we don't just see, we see, not by faith anymore, but we see the full reality. Jesus came, and he came to serve, and he came to give. And when we humble ourselves as servants of God, we keep him before us. And that enables us to serve no matter what happens to us. John 13, 14, and, and just, you don't have to turn there, you can just listen. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, the rabbi, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, some churches literally do that. They have foot washing services, and that's awesome. You know, but, but that's an attitude of the heart. I, I came to serve you. I came to do some of these things and and you know and the reality is you know if you're a leader if you're called to be a leader in the body of Christ you have to live as a servant you know leadership really isn't about just standing in a pulpit and having a platform it's really about serving it's really about giving 
It's really about serving the body of Christ. And we've talked about that, how, you know, even the apostolic and the prophetic, we've talked about a lot. It's not the block at the top of the pyramid. We try to do that in America. Uh, But it's really about, no, if you're a leader, if you're called to lead in the body of Christ, you're, you're that foundation. All right, Jamie and I are building a house. We keep standing out on our foundation looking at it. <laughs> Someday there are going to be walls out here, right? We love the foundation. It's really exciting. <laughs> it's getting boring, right? We love the rain. We're not mad at the rain, right? Char- Charlie Shant prophesied an unusual r- pattern of rain. Is this crazy? Are we seeing that happen? You know why? Because it was proof of the promises of God. And everything that God's spoken for years, sometimes decades, that say, look, this is, I, gave, I showed that this is what's happening. My promises are yes and amen, and they're true, and the rain is a sign of that. So even though we want stuff to happen a little bit faster, right? When it rains, I'm just like, God, your promises are true. What you've promised is true. Who has this kind of rain at the end of August? In Oklahoma, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. We're all having to mow again, right? (laughs) And again and again. So I totally got off on that, but hallelujah. That's a promise, you guys. He's doing something. But um, good grief, what was I talking about? Humility or servanthood or something like that. But, but you know, that's that thing of, of we're the foundation as leaders that launches so people can go further, that they can rise higher. That's what leadership looks like. It looks like servanthood. And sometimes people tell me, well, I'm called to this ministry and I'm called to do that, and yet they refuse to serve. And that tells me they are not ready for ministry. And we're all called to ministry. You guys know what I'm saying. We're all called to serve. And leadership, it really is about servanthood. Right? And Jesus, Jesus even said in Luke twenty two twenty seven, I am among you, I am among you as the one who serves. You, you you know sometimes where Jesus is? He's with Betty and Lisa cleaning the toilets. Nobody sees that. We see them come in. They're so excited. No, they really are. They come in happy. I'm among you as the one who serves. That teacher global harvest sitting with kids teaching them to read he's among you as the one who serves warming up their food in the microwave (laughs) hoping that at some point they can make it to the bathroom today (laughs) it's true they all get it, right? I'm making a connection with my audience, right? Leadership often means that it appears we're at the lowest place. But it's from this place that we launch others. You know, and, and that servanthood, it has to start with us individually. But what does it look like when there's a whole people, a whole people, a people, a church, that lives from a place of servanthood, right? You know, I mentioned, and I don't know, I've mentioned this to some people. I don't know if I said it in last week's service. If I did, I'll repeat it. But um, I know I said it to the prayer group beforehand. But, you know, I did my final interview for to pass Global Awakenings CHCP program, and it was an online Zoom conference with um, Dr. Rodney Hogue and Dr. Mike Hutchings. And, they just begin to basically prophesy to me in the course of that, and they were like, you know, we really see that, you know, you're, 
there's something shifting in your city because you and your church, you the apostolic anointing is increasing because you've persevered in the midst of some of the stuff that's been going on. There's a greater authority, and we see even in your transformation center and what you guys are doing in your church, we see ministers who are hurt and broken and burnt out, and they're coming and they're being ministered to, and they're being restored. And we see missionaries coming off the field because they need to be re- to be strengthened, and they need a season of rest and encouragement. And he said, what you guys are doing is so important. But you know what? That looks like servanthood. Because it looks like, and you know, we pour out so much as a church. We pour out so much in the Christian school, and and it takes supreme effort even to do what we're doing in the supernatural school. Right? But there's a, there's a further call for all of us as a body for what God's going to do. And, and we've known for years that God was going to send missionaries to come here for a season and be strengthened and refreshed. So that wasn't a new word to us. right? Because I think we'll own properties where they even come and live for seasons. What does that look like for a body to, to pour out in servanthood? And to say, man, I know that you're broken. Because much of the church right now is, let's just come and let's get our need met on Sunday morning. And that's important. We need that. We need that fellowship and we need teaching and we need worship, corporate worship and we need all those things. But what happens when we begin to be those who are like, okay, it's really not all about me. It's about us pouring our lives out into other people, into other ministries. Man, that's that's a powerful thing. You know, God's going to do that. He's wanting to do that through this. So I, I just want to put that before you as well as that, you know, that that's humility. That's servanthood. When we give of ourselves and we give of our lives. Amen. So we talk about all these things and, you know, so how how do we overcome pride? How do we walk in humility? Well, the Lord very simply says in Scripture, and, you know, sometimes we, we want the one, two, three, four. Just give me the steps on how to do this so I won't have any pride and I'll have a successful ministry or a perfect marriage, or financial breakthrough, you know. But what if we do what God says to do, and what does God say? He says, humble yourself. Present yourself to me. Give give me your life. Independence. And I'm not talking about getting born again again, but if you need to get born again, get born again. But it's presenting ourselves to him and saying, God, you told me that if I humbled myself, that you would meet me. You told me that if I gave you myself, that I offered myself to you and said, Holy Spirit, fill me. You told me that you would meet me. And you told me that if I humbled myself, you would exalt me at the proper time. Do you want to be exalted? You should. Don't put the false humility on right now. No, I don't want to be exalted. No, you do. But if we humble ourselves and we ask him, because you know what? You know, and I, I just was so aware in worship today as we were worshiping, I kept seeing Jesus. I kept seeing on the throne. I kept seeing him as a man in a fleshly glorified body in eternity right now, making intercession for us, a burning one, the glory of God upon him. And just, my God, I'm so, I'm seeing you. You're so holy and you're so worthy. And, and yet he's a lamb. The, lands, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In eternity right now, making intercession for us. And he wants to work his very nature and his very character in each one of us. And it may be that sometimes he'll put his finger on certain things. 
And he may say, you know, you don't have the right to that opinion anymore. Or, or you don't have a right in this area to do what you think. I want, to, I want you to follow me. Right? Isn't it amazing that he came to the disciples? And they're in the middle of their daily grind. They're in the middle of their livelihood. They're in the middle of their, their fishing. And he says, hey, follow me. And they put their nets down and they followed him. That's just amazing to me. Maybe they hated their job. I don't know. Like, I'm tired of fish. Right, but really, usually they were generally wealthy guys. And they followed him, and they laid aside everything. And, you know, sometimes God just wants to break in. Now, don't quit your job and do something goofy, right, unless he tells you to, right, and then get counsel. <laughs> That's not a bad thing. Okay. But humble our, humble, let's humble ourselves. Let's go after him. Let's pursue him. Right? And let's present, pre present ourselves to him. Say, Lord, do in me what you want to do. Work servanthood. Work humility. And you know, we're all in different places in our lives in that process, but God loves the process. It's just to stand this morning. And I'm not saying that you're going to have a Reese Howes moment or a Reese Howes encounter. Maybe you will. I don't know. But I want us just to present ourselves to him and say, Holy Spirit, I want you to do in me what you want to do. Amen. So let's just, let's just close our eyes for a moment and just position your heart. Just to extend your heart before him right now. Lord, we give you permission today. Holy Spirit, we give you permission. And we're, most of us are saved, and we've even been filled with Holy Spirit. But, Lord, I ask you even now just to do something different in us. That, that you just work a humility in us. That, Lord, we don't want to be resisted by you because of pride. Lord, you said that you resist the proud. So, Lord, I ask that you just work a humility in our hearts, that you work servanthood practically in us and through us today. Lord, not just to each other in this place, but, Lord, to our, our husbands and wives, our children, our jobs, our community. Lord, everything that you want to do, corporately through us in the future but lord would you meet us right now holy spirit would you come and just produce the life of the vine in us and through us we invite you god you don't need our invitation but lord we need you we need you to work in us and through us today. Produce the very nature of the Lamb in us. The Lamb on the throne in the presence of the Father right now. So, Lord, we give you permission. And, Lord, I ask that you just give us grace today. Lord, we humble ourselves under your mighty hand that you would exalt us as you see fit at the proper time. And Lord, we, we love you. Thank you for all your promises and that your promises today are yes and amen. And so in agreement with you for this prayer, we just say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So let him do what he wants to do. Praise God. Hallelujah. If he trims you up a little bit, well, we all need a good trim sometimes, right? Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Bless you guys today. Um, if you need um, healing prayer, um, over here.
if you need prophetic ministry right here. And I pray that you guys have a great holiday tomorrow. Be blessed. We'll see you at school or church or Walmart or somewhere. Amen. Bless you and have a great week. And happy birthday to, she's not in here, but Diana Hux. Tell Diana Hux happy birthday. Anybody else? Martha's is Wednesday, so wish happy birthday to these folks. Amen. Bless you guys.